Hi all. I wish to revisit a fraction of a game I looked at recently, of a Nigel Short game versus Michael Hennigan. And I posted to Nigel Short's page at ChessGamesCom, and I received some feedback from Nigel Short himself about the video annotation. And it brought up actually a different subject about engine analysis, because knight d7 was played in, in the game. And after knight e4, um, I had an engine view for validation. Well, I think I did turn on the engine. I, I'm not sure I had the engine on all the way through. I think I was just checking uh, some stuff uh, when I was commenting. But I did. I think I, I did see rook d7 and knight f6 as a possibility. But what I didn't see is actually the knight was attacking um, the bishop. And this this is an important thing to observe, actually, for, for why black collapses. Part of the reason why black's collapsing here. Um, black um, played king f8. And I think the final move was actually rook ed1. And then black resigned. Um, the, the thing is that if if we look at the, the like king king e8 as an example, uh, yeah, rook takes d7 and knight f6 is is crunching. And in this position, knight takes c5. There's rook takes d1. So knight f6 is a necessary move there. Um, but if if knight uh, b6, uh, I I want to sort of try and coin this main line syndrome. Again, I, I personally didn't notice that the bishop was was on here. I was just looking at rook d8, uh, because this was presented as the main line here, uh, uh, the strongest move, as you see here, rook d8, king g7, etc. And eventually knight takes c5. But from a human perspective, you know, looking at this game, you know, black must have been just thinking, you know, oh, if I move the knight, I'll lose the bishop. So the actual reality of the situation was lost. Because this main line uh, kind of focus, you know, that, that's why black resigns here. He can't defend the knight. The knight's defending the bishop. So the knight moves. White's just going to take the bishop. So, but this main line syndrome about, you know, the workings out, you know, I'd mentioned that in reply that, um, you know, kibitzers, when, when there's a relay of a game around the world and kibitzers got their engines on, they're seeing the main line, which is this, and it's constantly being changed according to the depth search. So the deeper it is, the main line is evolving. As it, you know, it's changing here, it's evolving. As you see, at the moment, the main line in inverted commas, which is what I would consider as the best moves for both sides. It's what the engine thinks are the best moves for both sides. Um, so it's behind the scenes, it's promoting and delegating variations to create that main line here you know, of plus five point, whatever. And the evaluation itself is, is changing all the time. Um, so you have a side effect of what I call mainline syndrome, that as a video annotator, I'm sometimes not presenting the obvious, you know, the obvious winning moves, because uh, I'm, I'm favoring these even more clinical-like finishes, you know, like knight b6, yeah, what's wrong with just knight take c5? In practical terms, that wins the game. But actually, it's the second line. And you might not think, well, this, this is no big deal, but it, but it is a big deal because I think people with increasingly powerful computers will increasingly get critical of what you know, GMs are playing because they immediately they're exposing themselves to only the main line and the workings out is all being lost. So without being too melodramatic, it's like we're, we're getting to be this abstract world where we don't really know what's going on anymore. We're just presented with the main line and think, well, why aren't the GMs playing the main line? And and then even, you know, there, there's these matches arranged, for example, at Chess Games Home, you know, which end up being, you know, people with the most powerful hardware presenting these main lines, which no one else understands. And because it's flicking through so quickly, they can't explain their main line. And when someone does try and explain it, it's like a breach of, you know, confidential information. Oh, this is the main line because at depth, you know, 28, that there's this tactical sacrifice, which meant that the line you think is so brilliant was actually promoted, sorry, relegated. And that's why this is like the main line now. So we have this main line, you know, syndrome. And this this ties in actually with this, uh, this book, strangely, um, 
you know, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance because um, to actually find new knowledge, you you know, you make hypotheses. Yeah, for you know, maybe the engine's wrong actually that it isn't a main line because there's some positional sacrifice. There's going to be, you know, some positions where it's it's going to underestimate a positional sacrifice um, because this is an incremental depth search. In other words, this depth look, it's just incremented by one, as you see just there. So if you if you assume that there is a fundamental weakness of an incremental depth search, um, how can you use this idea of creating hypotheses? Uh, to to sort of sometimes insert and test a move which you know the engine wouldn't consider. I'm not saying in this position. This this is clear cut. You know, a winning position for why non controversial. Um, but anyway, I want to quote you something from Forson, who I think is a very very strong correspondence player, and this is what he said. Um, so this was Umansky versus rest of the world, July 23rd of this year. To me, chess is a game about ideas. Let's call them hypotheses. One then seeks to prove one's hypotheses through analysis. What is analysis without hypothesis? It's what Ribka does and does better than be and does much better than us. And therefore, in my humble opinion, it's our job in these games to have ideas. We can use Ribka and its siblings to help check out those ideas. Alternatively, but essentially similarly and possibly concurrently, we can look at Ribka's analysis and then use it to gestate new ideas. Ideas can be expressed in words. Analysis can be expressed in PGN. Both humans and engines can do analysis, but the engines are better. This is what Nigel Short said recently, you know, regarding my, you know this video. So that that's what um, this correspondence grandmaster said, you know, about creating hypotheses to sometimes insert moves the engine wouldn't consider. It's not relevant here. Relevant here, though, is what Nigel Sort said. You know, this is the problem with analysing computers. One tends to focus on the main line and not use one's own judgments. I saw in an, another example a book on Chicago and Lake Hopskin, nineteen twenty-six, while lying in bed last night. After a white pawn advanced to e five, Black retreated his knight to e eight, which was criticised by the annotator, saying a more active knight d five was to be preferred. Quite correct, of course, but only if Black had noticed the apparently deadly queen e four, threading both the knight and mate on h7 so rather unusual um but it failed this idea so you can imagine this this queen going here attacking h7 in this night but apparently it failed to a rather unusual tactic um ribka sees this instantly of course and therefore rejects the line outright so if that line you know it would have been a flicker it would have been like a millisecond uh to have played knight d5 um um, so, so that was seen as a blunder because because Queen E4 was refuted by some other fantastic move. So it flickered out of being a main line. Yeah, basically that's what Nigel was saying. So Ribka sees this instantly and re rejects the line at right. The annotator didn't have his own brain engaged and therefore altogether missed the human dimension of Black's very understandable decision. So you know Black in the game just moved his knight back to E8. It's not bad apart from the fact you don't seem to notice. So the vi the video which I did, I I didn't seem to notice that the bishop on c5 was hanging for a long time, and it, it's it's true, you know, I was blinded by this main line, and I thought there was some sort of, you know, mating net when it, actually there wasn't. The bishop's not on f6. The king can escape on g7. So I I I'm calling this main line syndrome. It's where we sort of accept the computer's main line, and a we we can't challenge it because we don't know how. But there is a method. It's called creating hypotheses. The hypothesis, in my view, comes from knowing that there's an incremental depth search at work. And this, in fact, replaces the engine's main lines. But because of that, if you inject what I call inspiration to this perspiration, you know, this brute force perspiration, where does inspiration come? Well, I think there's a theoretical basis for positional sacrifices in pawn structure. You know, if there's a weak hole on d5, maybe you can sack the exchange there. So I think our ability to create um, hypotheses, I think that comes from an understanding, you know, of things like pawn structure and positional sacrifices and, and when statistically, you know, pieces can be sacrificed, etc. Those can create hypotheses. So I think we not only have the ability to challenge engines main lines, given enough time, um, but also when, you know, discussing games, there's also a more direct, immediate syndrome that we... We talk about the main line at the expense of all the other sublines, and even titled players are doing this. 
So I'm just saying I think our society at the moment, computers are going to get quicker and we're all going to be blinded by the main line. And I'll just like to label this main line syndrome. So you've heard it here. I'm going to label this concept main line syndrome. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.